So um, the wisdom tradition posits that the human being is essentially an amphibious creature, that we are designed to live in two dimensions of reality. And it uses uh, the cross as a symbol of this. So the two beams of the cross, the horizontal and the vertical, are the two dimensions of our life. There's the horizontal arm of the cross, which is our life and time. We live a life and time that's unfolding in a linear story and progression. Um, our little ego drama and story unfolding along this horizontal arm of the cross. But the wisdom tradition posits there is also this vertical dimension, which is the eternal, is spirit, is the infinite, that is always intersecting with and breaking into our life and time along the horizontal axis. But most of us have no awareness of or connection to that depth dimension, that eternal dimension. We're so fused to our story along the horizontal axis of our lives that there's no cultivation or awareness of this other world realm uh, that we're invited to live in. And uh, T.S. Eliot, he says this beautifully. He says that the occupation of the saint is to live at the intersection of time and timelessness. The occupation of the saint is to live at the intersection of time and timelessness. So if we map this, this cruciform pattern over the human body, what is the point of intersection? Of course, it's the heart. The heart is the point within the human person where time and eternity meet. And I'll read you a, a quotation here from Callistos Ware, who's an Eastern Orthodox Archbishop, writing of what the heart is. He says, the heart indicates the human person in its fullness in its unity. Above all, the heart is a symbol of wholeness, of integrity, of integration. So when we speak of the prayer of the heart, what we mean is prayer of the total person, prayer in which the one who prays is all together taken into the prayer. Uh, so this is a fully embodied, unified prayer uh, from the heart center and the heart itself is the symbol of that unity of time and eternity of spirit and matter it is the integrating point within our being and so uh, the practice that we're going to work with this prayer of the heart practice it's what we might call a heartfulness practice and in the western world today we're all very familiar with mindfulness practice which we've borrowed from eastern traditions and I think one of the limitations of that for us linguistically in English, when we hear mind, if I say mind, where's your mind, where would you point your finger? Most of us would point to our heads, of course. Um, of course, in Buddhist tradition, we're talking about big mind here. We're talking about consciousness. So we're not talking about mind in this little contained sense. But for most of us, mind is something in our heads. And so I love that the Christian tradition has historically anchored uh, this practice in the heart center. It gets us out of our heads, gets us into our body. And it also names something of the warm feeling tone of this kind of practice. There's a real sense of warmth and tenderness in prayer of the heart. So the desert Abbas and Amas, mothers and fathers, who were really reacting against Christianity's merger with empire, they said, we're losing the way here. And they began retreating from the cities into the deserts to establish centers that could keep this path of transformation alive. And often in their writings, they sum up the entirety of our spiritual work as the work of drawing the mind into the heart. You see this phrase over and over again, to bring the mind into the heart. And they understood this to mean they understood the mind or the intellectual faculty, our mental faculty, as being primarily a dualistic faculty, that the mind tends to perceive by way of subject-object division, parts and pieces, either or, and us and them. Um, the mind measures what we might call the quantitative universe. It calculates and quantifies and measures. 
And that, of course, is not a problem. That's a helpful tool. If we're going to function within this existence, we need to be able to, you know, know how much flour to measure put in the cake that we're making. We need to be able to calculate and quant servant of this deeper form of knowing it's not intended to be the master of the show so they understood the heart as being not the way we tend to hear it in the west as an uh, as the place where all of our mushy gushy feelings hang out instead they understood the heart as an organ of spiritual perception the heart is actually a a, a vehicle of knowing uh, it is a knowing perceiving organ. And <clears throat> they understood that the heart perceives by way of resonance, relationship, interconnection, and wholeness. The heart, as the mind, reads by the parts and pieces. And um, so we could say that while the mental faculty measures the quantitative universe, the universe of measurements, the heart reads the qualitative universe. We live in a, a universe of qualities like love and truth and beauty and joy. And the mind can't measure these. You can't measure these with, you know, a measuring cup, but the heart can perceive beauty. Uh, the heart can perceive love. So, they did talk about it. It's not that the um, that our emotions aren't also a part of the heart, but they talk about the work of purifying our emotions that often our coarse, dense emotions can cloud the clear seeing and clear knowing of the heart. Um, and so we learn to uh, purify and move deeper into the layers of the heart. And some of these contemplative maps will talk about actual spheres of the heart, the outer courtyard of the heart that you pass through and the, uh, the inner heart and the, finally the eye of the heart you come to in the very center of our being. So they understood the heart to be that in us which perceives oneness or wholeness. And they tie this very much to Jesus' teachings. And we'll see this in very explicit ways in the Gospels of Mary and Thomas. But we see it in the canonical Gospels as well. And one of the primary teachings connected to this is the Beatitude from the Sermon on the Mountain, which Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And they understood this to mean, we tend to hear this as, Blessed are the pure in heart now, for they shall see God later when they die. And the contemplative tradition says, no, when the heart is purified, when the mirror of the heart is polished, when the eye of the heart is open, we see God. We see the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We see God in every face and every creature and every rock and tree. We see that divine unity being expressed. So this is what the desert tradition was striving for. How do we purify the passions and emotions that clear, um, that, that cloud our perception so that we can see right? They also understood that this wasn't simply a moralistic purity. We hear purity as a sort of, you know, moralistic do's and don'ts, but purity of the heart. Uh, Brother Aiden here at Holy Cross Monastery uh, he has said that it could better be translated as unity of heart, that our will is unified within the heart. That's what true purity of heart is when the heart comes uh, into unity of will. So what I want to do, I want us to actually do a little experimenting with this kind of practice to get a sense of heart-centered um, uh, meditation or contemplative prayer. But before I do that, I want to connect what the ancient tradition says with what some contemporary uh, research is telling us about the heart. And if any of you are familiar with the Institute for Heart Math, you'll know a bit of this research. Um, heart Math is in mathematics. It's a California-based research organization that's been um, 
studying the human heart for some decades now. And, and what they've done, they, they study and measure what they call the energetic heart. Our heart produces a, a very measurable electromagnetic field, nothing uh, woo woo about this, just an actual measurable electromagnetic field is generated by our heart. And what they found by measuring this with an EKG is that the field of the heart is about 60 times greater in amplitude than the field generated by your brain waves. And it's measurable several feet outside of your body. Uh, your heart is really out there. And they found that what they did, they would give people heart-centered breathing exercises that are very much like ancient Orthodox prayer of the heart practice. Of course, they weren't doing this in a religious framework, but they would give people heart-centered breathing exercises and measure what would happen to the electromagnetic field of the heart. And they found that if someone had been in a, an emotionally jumbled state, constricted state, as they did this breathing practice, the field of the heart became much more coherent and much more uh, radiant, so to speak. And as they moved into that contemplative spaciousness, the field of the heart and the field generated by the brain moved into entrainment. They began to sync up together. And they found that most of us are not moving as a unified being most of the time. Our heart is running in that direction and our brain is running in that direction. But contemplative practice actually brings a degree of um, synchrony or alignment into the fields of our being. The other thing they found is that a good half of your heart cells, we historically, we've traditionally thought of the heart as just a muscle. It's a muscle pumping blood. Actually, at least half of your heart cells are neuron cells or brain cells, so to speak. The, um, the heart is a brain in its own right. It's literally receiving, interpreting, and relaying information to the other systems of the body continuously. And, and the information that's being put out through the fields of other people's hearts. So if you've ever walked into a room and before anything was said, you felt that someone was depressed or angry or joyful, it probably wasn't your imagination. It was probably your heart simply reading and picking up the subtle energetic information that's being communicated. That energy is being put out there. Your heart's receiving it and interpreting it. Um, once upon a time, we called this intuition. Now we can see that there's actually a scientific basis for it. And we've sort of trained ourselves to not trust our intuition, you know, that, oh, that's not reliable. But actually, we're finding that there is a good deal of reliable information that our body is often trying to communicate to us uh, that we have not been trained to factor in as products of Western civilization. Uh, they also found, and this is just cute, they hook people's pets up to EKGs as well. And of course, animals have hearts that also generate such a field. And when a, a cat or a dog, when their person left the room, the separation anxiety measured in their heart field. And when they were approaching, when they were turning, sometimes even before they came through the door, the pet sensed their person's energy signature and it registered in their heart. Um, and so we are communicating information at an energetic level all the time. And this says something about the responsibility we have to really be aware of our states, to be aware of what we're pouring out into the world. Are we fueling negativity and disconnection or are we encouraging um, love within the world? Because if I walk into a space and your heart is open and radiant, it's going to make it easier for my heart to open. And as my heart opens, it's going to make it easier for the next person's heart to open. And this is one of the beauties of, of shared practice. When we actually do contemplative practice or chanting or singing in community, we really are creating an actual resonant field of energy together. And we each of us makes it easier for the other uh, by lifting the other up with our own opening. So what these ancient traditions have been telling us about the heart, a lot of contemporary science is 
verifying for us uh, from another angle of vision. So what we'll do now, we'll just move into a little practice period just to get a little tasting of what this is about. And the prayer of the heart tradition, it works with classically what's called attention, which sounds just like it says, just the word attention. And for those of you who are trained in centering prayer, uh, this will sound like a little bit of a different instruction. In centering prayer, it's often said we work with intention, our intention to surrender during the period of practice to the, the operation of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, this practice actually says your attention, where you place your attention is also important. And they worked to anchor some degree of attention or awareness physically within the space of the heart or within the space of the chest. So I want to give you a little sense of what it's like to work with attention in this way. And so um, make yourself comfortable. If you have a pen moving, just let it pause for a moment. And I want to invite you to see what it's like to move your attention or your conscious awareness into your feet. Notice how this is different from thinking about your feet in your head. This is actually sensing your feet from the inside out, placing attention in your feet. And notice what happens as you do so. There might even be a sense of tingling, a sort of coming online. Oh, I have feet. And let that attention placed in your feet uh, move up the calves of your legs and feel your whole lower leg and feet held in conscious awareness, filled with attention. Now try doing the same thing with the palms of your hands and your fingers bring attention into your hands and into your fingers. And feel them alive in sensation. You might even notice your pulse coursing through your hands. So if you can get some sense of what that is, to feel awareness um, moving through the body, you might let it just expand outward now and feel more and more of your body held in conscious awareness and attention. So what the tradition does, it works with this capacity to anchor and move awareness through the body. And it, it anchors it very specifically within the physical center of our chest. Um, this includes the physical heart, but it's also more than that. Um, and so I want to invite you as you're able to simply bring your attention to your chest. And you might use your breath as an anchor, imagining that you are breathing in and out through your through your heart. And if it's helpful, you might even gently place a hand over your chest, over your heart center. this center or bandwidth of our being with the heart. The tradition places here qualities like warmth, a subtle sense of warmth awakening in the heart, tenderness,
sweetness. And of course, love, but not just that sticky, sweet, clinging kind of love, but objectless, radiant love, love that is simply loving. And if you're having any difficulty sort of feeling into or anchoring in this heart center, that's totally normal because we're not trained to stake our center of selfhood here. We're so trained to stake it in our mind, in our brain, that it can be like flexing a new muscle to stake it in the heart. And I'll invite you to try this exercise that I, I like to think of sometimes as the back door into the heart when we have trouble actually finding that center. And so I wanna invite you to call into the eye of your heart, the face of a beloved. And the beloved can take many forms. It could be a beloved pet, a cat purring in your lap or a dog jumping up to greet you. It could be a beloved parent or mentor, a beloved friend or spouse or partner it could be a beloved child or grandchild in your life or even a beloved tree in your yard but the beloved is someone in whose presence your heart opens in gratitude opens in love and take a moment to hold that face of the beloved within the space of your heart and just notice as you breathe through the heart and through their image what opens in the heart And then as you're ready and able, allow yourself to gently release the object, rest in love, now becoming objectless, simply love loving, gratitude gratituding, joy joying with no object. And as you do so, listen to receive these words from St. Theophan the Recluse who is a Russian Orthodox monk in the prayer of the heart tradition. He writes, attention placed in the heart gives birth to warm tenderness of heart, which in turn increases attention. They grow in strength together, supporting each other. They give depth to prayer, gradually quickening enlivening the heart banishing distraction and wandering thoughts they bestow on prayer its purity the fruit of prayer is the concentration of attention in the heart accompanied by a feeling of warmth when attention descends into the heart it attracts all the powers of the soul and the body into one point there this concentration of all human life in one place is reflected in the heart by a special sensation that is the beginning of future warmth. The sensation faint at the beginning becomes gradually stronger, firmer, deeper.
So with this practice, attempts to do little by little as we bring attention back to the space of the heart, you seat or center of selfhood. We've so often staked our selfhood within our mental apparatus, within our thoughts. And we've said, this is me. The constant monologue in my head is me. But this practice invites us to actually discover an identity staked in the heart that in some ways is a non-identity just pure presence, just pure love, to begin to discover this as the seat and center of our selfhood. Normally, I would invite some reflection on what this experience has been for you at this point, but we'll hold that off for a little bit longer since we're in this Zoom format. Um, and I wanna add one more layer to this practice. Traditionally, the prayer of the heart was coupled with, in the Eastern Church, what's called the Jesus Prayer. And uh, the Jesus Prayer, the most popular version is, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And the longer version is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And they're even very short versions. I learned it from an Anglican nun who taught me simply to breathe in Jesus on the in-breath the love held in that name, and to breathe out mercy on the out-breath, mercy and compassion for all creation, breathing in Jesus, breathing out mercy. Um, but I like to make an, uh, an important distinction between the prayer of the heart, which is this work of anchoring attention and awareness in the heart center, and the Jesus prayer, which is a word prayer that can be coupled with the prayer of the heart to serve as an anchor. Um, and they're so often coupled, they often become synonymous, but I find it helpful to make a slight distinction there. And I'll read to you here again from St. Theophan on the work of adding a word. He says, whether it be the Jesus prayer or any other short prayer it's in the mouth that you're saying the prayer, only take care that the attention is in the heart and not in the head, and hold to this not only when standing in prayer, but at all other times as well. What is it at all times to have some degree of awareness anchored in our heart? At all times. Um, so I want to invite you to come back to that space and to add a sacred word. And I know some of you are centering prayer practitioners. If you have a, a comfortable, familiar sacred word or a mantra from another tradition, feel free to use that. Um, if you don't have a sacred word and would like to experiment with one, you could always choose something very simple like home or peace or love or heart. Um, or you might experiment with this simple form of the Jesus prayer, breathing in Jesus, the love embodied in that name and that person, breathing out mercy, uh, mercy and compassion for all creation. Um, whatever word you choose, just stick with it for the next little while, but that, the most important instruction here is that as you add the word, you speak the word not in your mental center, but in the cave of your heart. See what it is intuitively to breathe this word in through your heart and out through your heart and let it echo there. Um, and so I invite you now to add whatever word you feel moved to add, Jesus, mercy, or, or something else, and to begin speaking the word in your heart and paired with the breath if that's helpful. It doesn't have to be that way. And if you find awareness pulling back up into your mental center, just gently redirect it to the space of the heart and to the word in the heart. And remember, if the word feels distracting or falls away, it's fine to let the word simply fall away also and just to be in that presence.
Again, Theophan writes, if the mind becomes exhausted by saying the words of the prayer, then pray without words, bowing down before the Lord inwardly in your heart and giving yourself to God. This is true prayer. Words are only prayer's expression and are always weaker in God's eyes than prayer itself. And as you rest a moment longer in that heart space, as you're able, see if you can feel the field of your heart in such a way that it's not simply that your heart is in your body, but that your body is held within the open field of your heart. Know yourself as that open expanse of loving, nameless presence. And imagine the fields of our hearts extending and overlapping as together we form one collective heart. And feel the world held within our collective heart, our beautiful blue-green planet. The broken heart of our world held within And as you're ready, you can begin to gently open your eyes. But as you do so, continue to hold a bit of awareness within that heart space, even with your eyes gently open or opening. Let's take just a few. If anyone wants to respond from that contemplative space, um, what your experience with this was. Um, we're not moving into our final discussion just yet, just opening your experience of this prayer. Uh, and it could be that there's no right or wrong. It could be I couldn't feel my heart center at all. Uh, it could be that's where I always go in prayer. It could be that was something entirely new. So no right or wrong responses, but if there's anything arising for you, uh, feel free uh, to share and we'll hear a few voices. Just um, make sure to unmute yourself. Patricia said in the comments that warmth spreads out from her heart into her body. And there is a beautiful sense in which that heartful presence, it becomes not so much that we are in our heart or our heart is in one place, but that heartfulness can be in every cell of your being. You can feel your heart humming within your feet, your hands, um, and moving even out beyond yourself. Any other responses?
no I pressure liked, to share. Yeah. yeah, Shayana. Yeah, I liked the moment where the heart was the outward space holding it and the switch happened. That was really beautiful. I, I, it was a little different for me. Mm. Beautiful, thank you. Yes, what if we right now are living inside the divine heart? What if the universe is held within the heart of God? What if that one divine heart is the heart beating uniquely in each of us and in every being? Here we are, expressions of God's heart held within God's heart. And uh, I think that's something we can experience as we move down into the ground of our own heart. Uh, there's a point at which uh, we're, we're in the ground of our heart. This is my heart. And this is the heart in which I and all is held at one and the same time. And we find that as we move deeper into that love, there is no clear demarcation where I end and God begins. Uh, rather, the heart is like an intertidal zone where I wash into God, God washes into me, and you can't draw a clear, fine line that separates the two. Um, and that's what that map of the cross is saying, that, that point of intersection within us. Um, it's the place where the two worlds meet and are one. I think I saw Marilyn with her self unmuted. Yes, um, I first started practicing this from Cynthia's book, um, the one where she talked about the Heart Math Institute and how to do this. And that was probably about six years ago. I found it very difficult at first because I'm so mind oriented, I'm so intellect oriented all of my life. And, but I find increasingly, I've also been working with Sufi friends I have just discovered and have a Murshid or a master that I'm working with in this communication. And I find it is uh, reverberating in my heart. I can actually feel it in my heart. There are times when I can feel this warmth and increasingly so as I sensitize myself to the concept. It, it was really hard at first. I'd never felt my heart before, I don't think. Yeah. yeah. So I'm Thank you, beautiful. And um, I see, a, I see um, Sue and Jay there, but I, I want to read a couple of the comments in the uh, chat box. Um, Carol said that her heart feels sore and broken. Uh, I think that's true for a lot of us, that um, there's a lot of pain that we hold in our hearts. And also, uh, there's a reason that culturally we've learned to guard and protect our hearts. Um, because the heart reads from wholeness and interconnection, as we open our hearts, we open our hearts to the pain of the world. Um, the heart is sensitized to the whole web of life in which we're interwoven. And we see that the world's pain is our pain and our pain is the world's pain. And I think often we've learned to numb and guard our hearts so that we don't have to feel that. Um, and there's a, a flip that can happen as we go into that pain um, if we feel it from the perspective of our ego our finite self we go it's my pain but if we go oh this, this is the world's pain this is our collective shared pain so our pain can be a point of disconnect it's what shuts me off or it can be the actual point of connection my pain connects me to the pain of the world um, but we always need to be really gentle with ourselves. We can be holding and carrying a lot in our hearts, and there can be a lot that's built up and stored up over years there. And so as we go into our hearts, you know, things may open, um, and we want to have space to, to process, hold, and heal that. So if you're finding tenderness, that's, um, that's not unexpected. Um, and another, another comment here. I feel heartbroken because I don't think the heart can perceive a person's heart. That's true and not, not true. I think there is a sense, um, there is a resonance that's felt really in close proximity, but I think the heart also is a non-localized phenomena. There's a non-dimensional point in the heart through which we are connected intimately and instantaneously to every heart in creation. And, um, space, time, and distance 
uh, are nothing in light of that. And so we are connected. Uh, yes, we don't feel that immediate resonance that you feel when we're right in a room chanting and singing, but, but do know that uh, that connection can never be severed and distance uh, does not lessen it. And the more we practice, the more that connection is available regardless of physical proximity. And you'll find even people that you love that are no longer in the body that have died um, and that are at home in the heart of God now, through your heart, you can tune into the essence of someone you love. You can call into your heart, you know, not a memory of someone, but the essence of their self, the essence of who they were. And that's still alive in the heart of God, the essence of who they were. And you can tune right into it through the, the channel of your own heart. Um, and I, I think maybe Sue or Jay were going to speak. Yes. Um, it just as we were praying a little while ago, um, I was um, using that um, time to do the breathing in with Jesus and the breathing out um, with mercy. And interestingly um, enough, um, as I, after I'd done that several times, the, the word that popped into my head after um, Jesus was love. And it struck me as a conversation between me and Jesus um, in that I was breathing in Jesus and the response was, was love, um, both um, on his part and also on my part. It was almost like, you know, okay, Jesus have mercy or Jesus have Jesus mercy. And then, you know, the love being the, uh, the result of that. Beautiful, lovely, thank you. Yeah. Put, a big, put a big smile on my face. <laughs> Thanks be to God, yeah. Love her and beloved dancing in the heart. Um, there's a wonderful um, label from Robert Sardello. Uh, he's written books on silence and on the heart. has a lovely book, um, I think called Heartfulness. Uh, he talks about the heart as holy relation. And it's all hyphens in there. One phrase, heart as holy relation. That the heart is this relational field. And he says, um, I love this. He says, when we are in the heart, the world becomes a temple of presences. That when we're in the mind, we're in a, a world of its and objects, right? You know, the tree is just an object and, and the table is an it. And oftentimes even people are its and objects. But he says, when we are living and moving from the heart, the world becomes a, and everything becomes a, a temple of presences. Because we are reading the actual presence, the actual resonant vibration of that, that being. Um, and Cynthia Bourgeau, she goes on and she says that remembrance of God is not a mental concept. It exists deeply embodied as vibration, a homing frequency to which we can become increasingly sensitively attuned. That there's a homing frequency, a homing vibration planted within our hearts that is trustworthy and that is aligned straight to God that we can sensitively attune ourselves to it more and more through our practice. Um, and that's, uh, with the practice like this, we are learning to just attune to the resonance of the heart more and more. And uh, the wonderful thing about a heart-centered practice like this is that you don't just have to do it on a cushion 20 minutes twice a day. You carry it with you into the world. What is it to take my morning walk with the dog with awareness in my heart? How does it change my relationship to an experience of everything? My awareness is in my heart. Uh, what changes if my awareness is grounded in my heart as I'm washing the dishes? Uh, what changes if my awareness is in my heart while I'm having a conversation with a friend? And this becomes very practical, especially in tense and heated moments uh, when, let's say that you're in a board meeting or you're having a fight with a family member or a friend and something, you know, there's tension, we tend to pull up into our heads and we start thinking ahead of the conversation, how I'm gonna best this person. I'm gonna come up with the right argument, the right thing to say, and 
we start spinning our gears out in our heads. If in those moments you can consent to, to maintain awareness within your heart, to say, I'm not going to leave the space of my heart, uh, things tend to, it tends to change, reconfigure the ballpark incredibly. Um, uh, an example of this I sometimes use, I was in a board meeting a while back and a friend of mine said something that to me came across as unintentionally and unconsciously racist. It was the sort of critique of identity politics and blah, 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 and we just need to come together in unity. And I was you know, thinking, but we can't come together in unity until we address the systemic injustices that keep us separate. You know? And so I could feel myself like getting hot, getting angry, like, and I was like, Ugh. and and then I thought, okay, if I respond from this place, I'll just pour ego fuel on the fire. And I said, let me come back to my breath and come back to my heart. And I breathed through my heart and I waited till I could speak from my heart. And then I said, I'm feeling a lot of anger in my body right now. And I was able to speak vulnerably about why I was experiencing that. And it was not a, you're making me angry. You know, I didn't do this. I was able to speak vulnerably out of my physical embodied experience. And so the other person that didn't move on to the defensive because I hadn't, I had said something vulnerable rather than reactive. And, um, and then we actually came to a place of really template practices, practical relationally. Um, take it into your relationships and especially those tense moments and put awareness down into your heart and see how it changes what happens. Um, are there any other responses? I'm curious too if any of you um, had experience with what it was to place the word here rather than to place the word here, if that was helpful or not. But I see Marilyn. I, I had a question. Could you, say that, what, could you say that one more time about how that becomes your identity? I had a distraction and I think I, it would help me if you could say that again, how eventually or slowly that becomes your identity, that, that centrality of your Absolutely. in the heart. Yeah. So we're, we're working to cultivate or stake a new seat or center of selfhood. That's, that's not just in the mental center. We tend to think that we are just, our head, which is the real me. Um, it's often said in this kind of practice that the heart begins as a place we go to, but increasingly it becomes the place we come from. Uh, more and more we are naturally living from the heart. So it starts out like really a workout. You know, you're flexing this muscle that draws the mind into the heart, and then you're back in your head and you flex the muscle and draw the mind back into the heart. But more and more, you learn to just keep a little bit of awareness there. And even when awareness isn't there, the route back to the heart becomes so familiar. It's such a well-worn path that within a second, you can just go there. You can just go to the heart. Um, and so the idea is that we're cultivating a new identity that in some ways is a non-identity. Uh, most of our identities are in our roles. I'm a a mother, a husband, a housewife, a doctor, a nurse, a priest, you know, that's my identity, or my identity, um, you know, it's all those things. My identity is in my family dynamics, and, and uh, to learn access of my being and there's also a deeper identity of come to know in the heart as we rest in the heart it has no label it has no name it's just presence it's just love it's just openness and to come to know ourselves as that well for one thing it makes death less frightening you know all those other identities fall away with death the roles and labels that are necessarily part of the horizontal axis when when we fall out of that um what remains? What remains is this love, is this presence. And if we come to know ourselves as that, we realize it never goes away. It doesn't come from anywhere and it doesn't go anywhere. It's always there. And so we can learn to know ourselves as that. 
And in fact, it can, in a way, free us to play our roles in the world more fully because we're not fused to them. You know, I can take on this role when I need to. I can take on this identity when I need to, but I'm not fused to it because I know myself as a heart. Um, I know Cynthia Bourgeau says that Eckhart Tolle, he used to say that when he's holding a teaching post, let's say he's in, in an auditorium with a lot of people and he's on the teaching post and he's holding forth as the spiritual teacher. Um, well, while he's on that stool, he needs to do that. That is his function in that moment. But she said that he says if he then goes to the grocery store and he's putting his broccoli in the shopping cart and he's still holding that post, well, then it's becoming pathological. He's fused to the teacher identity, right? And it's like, no, it's a function. You, you do it and then you set it aside. Um, but so often we become fused to our functions. We can become fused to our roles. And what's really tragic then is um, if for some reason that function is taken away from us, we feel that we've lost ourself. You know, they've taken myself away from me. Um, but if well before that can never be taken away. So, um, I'm going to glance over here and see what comments have come in word to the heart um, helpful uh, and that focusing on words sometimes um, is not helpful because you know it happens in the monkey mind to focus on the heart i imagine breath moving down my throat and into the heart and i could really tell the difference that time uh, having the word there instead of in the head so so very often we've been taught to that meditation practice we say a word okay it all it's like this we're in our heads and I'm going to say a sacred word in my head to try to get rid of thoughts in my head. And it's like, it's just a whirl up here. It's like, I'm in my head trying to get rid of thoughts, trying to say my word. And no one ever tells us, you can just drop out of your head. You can just drop down into your heart. You can drop down into your body. You can drop down into your feet. And, and Theophan says this. He says that um, as we move into the heart, thoughts and distractions tend to slow naturally because we're no longer staked there it's sort of like if you imagine uh, an electric fan and the flan, fan blade is turning and turning and turning when you unplug it it just immediately stops right no right it keeps turning when you unplug the fan because there's that centripetal motion centrifugal motion that's keeping it going even though you you're no longer energizing it and the mind is like that the thoughts are swirling 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 but if we unplug fan of the brain, slowly they start slowing down. And one way to unplug the head is to plug into the heart, you know, take the plug out and plug it into the heart and then just let those fan blades stop, stop worrying. I think there were a few other people that had some comments. Matthew. Yeah, it's Dana. Dana, when you were talking about the, yeah, please. Uh, the, the fusion of, uh, identity. It, I, I grabbed my notes from a Zoom conference with uh, Cynthia Bourgeau a few weeks ago on Father Keating, because she was very close to him as he neared death. And this was taking apart his poems. But she said what he, of course, he talked so much about the false self, but she felt what he finally came to was the idea of the false self being any fixed point of reference so that it becomes all flow, kind of what you were talking about with dropping one identity to go to the next, whatever is suitable at that moment. Beautiful, it becomes all flow, that's right. If we are receiving our life moment by moment from the source, um, there's no identification. We receive this moment and what it calls for and what it demands, and we receive the next moment, what it calls for and what it demands. And we're not, we're not becoming fixated on any one point or role or identity. And I think in, in some sense, that's what we discover in practice is that we have no fixed identity. We have no fixed point of identity. And we believe that we do. We believe that 
the story of my life and the things that have happened to me and the roles that I hold, that somehow they form a solid fixed referent. But as we move into the heart, we find there is no fixed point. There's just open space. And um, how liberating, how freeing to discover that. But also sometimes how terrifying to the ego because it wants to pretend that it is real, that it is fixed, that it is preservable over time. Um, and uh, anyway, yeah. Um, hi. Yeah, Mary Kate. Um, so I think all this is what we, you've recently been um, re talking about and referring to is, can the, your last thing about it can be quite a scary venture you know, I think as a, um, as a woman and having been a mother now for, I don't know, 45 years almost, um, my role, you know, I didn't want to identify myself as just being a mother. And so, you know, I went to graduate school and got my degree and then worked. And at each point, I began to identify myself in that role. At the same time, I always knew that that wasn't my identity, right? But it's like when you interact within society, I think especially, you know, with say in the last so many years, is that's what people see. And I remember, um, you know, when I had to sort of give up all my work and move overseas with my husband, um, was that... I didn't have an identity anymore. I wasn't working. And so because you're in this professional setting, you know, people sort of look at you like, you know, what do you do and who are you? And you begin to identify yourself, who you, what you're doing and who you are. And I just think it, you know, I can't speak from being a man, but I think sp speak from being a woman is that this kind of practice and knowledge could be so, so helpful because, you know, it, you, you don't have to then go into these roles. You are who you are. And I think this is, uh, comes about too, and then later as your children start leaving and, you know, you're not working anymore and, and then who are you and how wonderful it is to be able to fill that with true essence of what life is. And I just think it's great. Yeah, beautifully said, beautifully said. Thank you, Mary Kate. One of the other um, beautiful things with this uh, practice, I think we often, we think that, this goes back to that unitive sense, that deep oneness. We think that without um, duality, there can be no love. You have to have a lover and a beloved, right? And this gets into our Trinitarian language in the Christian tradition a little bit. Um, but um, Sardello says, and I find this true in my own practice, he says that when we move into the ground of the heart, we discover, this is the quote from him, pure intimacy. Intimacy without someone or something attached to that intimacy pure intimacy, intimacy without someone or something attached to that intimacy. We tend to think that that's not possible. That that's a contradiction. You can't have intimacy. But what we discover is that we are held within this web of intimacy, this, this you know, infinite tender oneness. Um, and so anyway, I encourage you as you practice to experiment with that. What is this feeling of intimacy um, that doesn't have an object? And how would it change me to live from that? And it also allows us to hold everything in that intimacy um, and to restore a sense of animacy and sacredness to everything. If we move from the heart and we see that the world is a temple of presences, then it changes the way we walk on the earth. It changes the way we interact with the other creatures we share the planet with, uh, everything shifts because everything is in that sacredness. I think I saw a couple other people with some responses. Um, Mark, did you have something? No. Nope. No, okay. Any others?
So this, this is also a place where we can add in um, the teaching and the Christian contemplative tradition on kenosis word. And, and it's from the New Testament. St. Paul uses it, kenosane. Um, it simply means self-empty, to empty oneself. And Paul uses it in the Christ hymn in the letter to the Philippians, where we're told that though he was in the form of God, he did not, Christ, did not count equality with God, something to be grasped, but rather emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, taking human form. And so it's seen in the wisdom tradition that this act of self-emptying is the gesture at the heart of the entire movement of Jesus' life, that he's continually emptying. Um, and of course, if we're continually emptying, we're also continually being filled. It's like a water wheel. Um, that is, we pour ourselves out. We are, it's this gesture of, of emptying. We drop from the mind into the heart, we, and we let go. It's, that's another way to translate kenosis, letting go. Um, we tend to want to cling to identities, experiences, and thoughts. In practice, we just release gently. You, you, we're not pushing anything away. There's no violent gesture or movement, just a gentle release. And with that release, we drop into the heart. Um, and what the tradition says is we begin developing what sometimes is called a magnetic center in the heart. Um, that there's like a pull, a literal, literal tug in the heart. Um, as the heart comes online more and more, that homing beacon pulls us back and pulls us back. And I'll read you a quote here that captures this really beautifully from Cynthia. She writes, she's writing about, about magnetic center in our being. Through the constant practice of letting go, of the surrendering of thoughts, not for any reason other than the pure gift of surrender, something develops in us. And experienced practitioners of centering prayer rather quickly come to the place where they feel at the center of their being this tug, this visceral tug in the heart, this honing in on the divine presence. And it has nothing to do with thinking about it in the mind. It's not in the mind. It's totally visceral. But something through the process of yielding, through the actual act of surrender, develops a very clearly magnetic center. And then you have your homing beacon. You have your homing beacon in you and you can follow. You can reliably follow the divine hologram, the pattern of your life as it unfolds from the point of God. And not, not screw up the pattern and, and the end. You go with the pattern. So it's learning to trust spontaneously from that point of our hearts. Um, and so this is what we're doing in a practice like this. We're cultivating something that is trustworthy, uh, that God has placed God's self within our hearts. And as we cultivate sensitivity to that connection, our life unfolds more and more gracefully from it. And I see that a few wonderful quote, comments have come in here, and I want to just Let's take a moment to glance at them. I think some of Jesus' presence is love, is God. It feels like truly resting in love. These thoughts and your question, what if we were all held in the heart of God, reminded me of the song. Ah, a wonderful song there. So follow the link all later if you want to. And um, one person commented, that this explains their experience of God's mercy. It was just mercy without anything attached to it. Um, mercy, I've, I've often said that if we summed up the entirety of the Hebrew and Christian scriptures in one word, it would be the word mercy. Um, and for those of you who pray the Psalms daily, if you pray the daily office, I think more than half of the occurrences of the word mercy in the scriptures are in the Psalms. Uh, and some of the Psalms, it's every verse, for God's mercy endures forever, for God's mercy endures forever. Um, and again, if you pray the daily office, mercy shows up in the New Testament canticles. Um, 
In the tender compassion of our God or in the mercy of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. And in the Magnificat, Mary's canticle, um, God has remembered God's promise of mercy. And so coursing throughout all the scriptures, there's this, this sense of mercy. And we tend to, unfortunately, in the Western world, hear this in very juridical terms, like you're begging for mercy before the judge, which isn't the biblical sense. Um, we are in an ocean of mercy. We are swimming in mercy. Um, and so this comment that what you experienced as you moved into the heart was just mercy um, is perfect. Um, and our English word mercy, it's even, it's re related to our words for merchant and for mercantile, a sense of exchange. And so the, the sense that there is an exchange between our heart and God's heart, um, that mercy flows in both directions. And uh, Cynthia Bourgeau has beautifully said that mercy is the lifeblood that courses through the mystical body of Christ. Mercy. Uh, so this isn't the groveling, have mercy on me. This is have mercy in me and through me and swim in that ocean of mercy. Um, you know, I thought maybe we would start talking about Thomas today, but clearly we'll spend tomorrow morning. First thing, we'll do a deep dive into the Gospel of Thomas. But I'm really glad we spent time with these two pieces because I don't want the Gospels of Thomas or Mary Magdalene just to be sort of intellectual explorations. These are really deeply contemplative, heart-centered, transformative texts. And I think we need this wisdom background and this heart background to really see what these texts are unpacking for us. Um, so any other, any other thoughts or comments that, you, yeah, Marilyn. Could you um, just remind us what those references, uh, which book of Cynthia's were you coming from and Sardello's also would be helpful. Yeah, I will, you know what I can do? I don't have it now, but I can upload some, like a bibliography and some quotations and things and give them to you as a link. Delo's book is his book, Silence, and his other book, Heartfulness. Um, and if you want a really contemporary sort of free of approach to this heartfulness practice, that Sardello book is a really great thing to explore. Um, and if you want, want a more tra traditional dive in, there's a wonderful book called Prayer and Orthodox docs and thorough or something like that. someone who gathered all these it's a really a source book of orthodox voices on the prayer of the heart um so that'll give you some really traditional reference points and the other book i'm reaching for it is cynthia's book, cynthia bourgeois book the heart of centering prayer um in it for the first time that i'm aware of she really intentionally dialogue centering prayer tradition the prayer of the heart tradition. And they really are two different practices, two different lineages of practice. Centering prayer was sort of a, a, a reboot of contemplative practice based primarily on the cloud of unknowing that Thomas Keating and Pennington started. And the Orthodox prayer of the heart is of course um, what we've been exploring here. And so she really brings those two into dialogue and has a wonderful um, section in this book called The Way of the Heart, which you can find online, that chapter, was released as an essay in Parabola magazine. And so if you Google the way of the heart, Parabola, um, you'll find this chapter as a solo read, single read. So, and I'll try to remember and share that link as well. Um, one of the things that people who have really practiced in centering prayer can be concerned about is um, the centering prayer teaching is um, you don't put your awareness on anything, right? That's a thought. Even if you scratch your nose, if you, that, that is a thought by centering prayer. Um, it's anytime awareness moves from spacious, open awareness into subject object clarity. Um, that is thought in centering prayer lingo. So we're really cultivating just spacious, open awareness and practice. And when you find yourself pulling back subject object, you release it and return to the openness. So the concern has been, I'm gonna mute on everyone's mics for a second. Um, the concern has been that, well, in centering prayer, 
if you're putting your awareness on your heart, isn't that a thought? Um, and Cynthia really brilliantly says, no, you're not putting your mind on your heart, you're putting awareness in your heart. And so you're letting that open, undivided awareness open out from the heart, but you are not creating a subject object thought division in that process. And so I think the two practices actually can dovetail beautifully. And a lot of centering prayer practitioners have said that over the years, as they do that gesture of release and drop, they do go to the heart. That is what begins to be cultivated. Um, but we're not often told in centering prayer teaching, you don't have to wait a decade to drop into your heart. You can and just do it right between these two practices is, is really fruitful and I'm excited to see it happening um, across those lineages. Um, so we're coming up to an hour and a half. Any, any other final thoughts or insights from, or share, just sharings? Um, and some of you have, oh, someone shared, Val Valerie Wattenberg shared the Parabola article. So you have an access to it and link there. Thank you for that. And there's some really wonderful quotations coming in, uh, chats coming. I haven't been able to read them all. So if anyone has shared something they'd like to share aloud, feel free to do that now. What was the Orthodox title? You were breaking up a little bit there. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's called um, The Art of Prayer, an Orthodox Anthology. Um, and there's a lot of St. Theoph and the Recluse in that book. And um, yeah, that's a, a treasure trove of a book, especially the Theophane passages. And if you don't know St. Theophan, uh, T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N, he's worth digging into. Yeah, Patricia. Um, as we were going through the prayer in the heart and working from the heart and allowing the heart to expand, um, the whole theme that, that kept with me throughout all this was all that's been going on in the world right now, the sad things that have been happening, mm -hmm. and how we can help and what we can and should be doing. And I just felt like this warmth, this heat in my heart was going out and reaching out, not only as a, I sit in one place and send my love out to the world, but that this enables me to walk out in the street, see my neighbor, whoever he is, as hail son of God, and love him immediately because we are all one from the heart. And it just seems to me that this work that we're doing has to be going there. Yeah, yeah and our, our contemplative practice is never simply for the sake of ourselves. It's never contemplative navel gazing. We practice for and on behalf of the whole world and the whole of creation. Um, that as we work to open our hearts, we're working to open the heart of the world. And as our hearts open, it's gonna make it easier for other hearts to open. And it's gonna make it easier for our hearts to meet up and sync up with other open hearts. And so we are trying to cultivate and grow a collective human heart. Um, and yes, our prayer needs hands and feet and action in the world, uh, but we want that action to be flowing from alignment with our heart. Um, as Cynthia says, if we're flowing from alignment with that magnetic center, whatever we're called to do, whatever it looks like, we know that it will be flowing out of integrity with our deepest, truest self, rather than some, you know, rational minded thing we tried to concoct and come up with. We're flowing and we can trust if we're aligned with our heart and moving from our heart, God will push us into the situations we need to be pushed into. Um, we'll find the responses that we need to give. And honestly, a, a wisdom will be accessible and available to us that, that wouldn't otherwise be. And yeah. any, of you, any of you who do spiritual direction work, I know that some of the most brilliant, wonderful guidance I've ever given anyone in spiritual direction, I couldn't take an ounce of credit for it because I was just in a centered open space and I found myself asking a question or saying something and it was the thing that shifted something open but it didn't come from me it just flowed through the channel of an open heart and um, and so 
when we're in that place, what arises is trustworthy. And it might, what arises might be get out there in the streets and protest. What arises might be do X, Y, or Z. Um, but we want it to arise from there. Well, I was very heartened in our own town. I'm, I'm in Pennsylvania. They had gatherings in the, the downtown area that when anybody started to be disruptive, the people all together began to sing hymns. And I saw, I witnessed this centering heart among a great many people that I didn't even know. And I was so encouraged. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, oh, okay. oh yeah, Shelley, go ahead. Oh, it, it, this, this question is prompted just by the last comment, but it arose when you're talking about uh, the heart uh, the Heart Math Institute and the extent to which they can measure uh, uh, heart heart and um, the connection one to the other. And uh, immediately for me, um, I'm thinking about my Centering Prayer group, which is merely an email group at this point. Well, I don't, we're not Zooming. And when I'm communicating, my heart is, is traveling through the waves. And so it's intriguing to me. You're touching on this, I think, several times. Uh, m my heart with someone who's died. Um, are, 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 uh, they haven't measured it, I don't believe. But of course, it's not confined to physical presence, I guess is what I'm saying. Yes. I'm just intrigued by the measurements and then how that feels in my own life. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we might use as a metaphor, and this is, you know, probably, you know, me as a mystic co-opting scientific language and using it poorly, but, you know, we know um, uh, sort of quantum entanglement and the way two parts, that two, um, you know, yes, yes. I don't know, the, no, two quarks or whatever that have been connected yes. and you separate them and you spin one here and the other one 50 miles away spins instantaneously, that there is some kind of deep, non-localized connection and I think the heart moves from and reads from that level of connection mm -hmm. and so yes your centering prayer group doesn't need to do zoom to be connected but thank god we have zoom <laughs> yes yeah oh well um maybe I'll send us out with uh, a final word from Cynthia and this is this is from chapter two, note 10, and the footnotes in the back of the book and the end notes. This is why you always have to read Cynthia's end notes. She packs all kinds of little treasures in there. So she's talking about this embodied dimension of heartful practice, heartfulness. Um, and she's quoting from Sardello. She says, no wonder the embodied aspect of heart spirituality is so important. For if Sardello is right here, and my own work confirms that he is, then the stunning conclusion is that there is no lack. That primordial hunger for intimacy and belonging we so frantically project onto others in our attempt to find fulfillment is fulfilled already there in the infinity of love already residing holographically in our own hearts once we have truly learned to attune to its frequency and trust that with which it reverberates. In this sense, our physical heart is the quintessential treasure buried in the field. And so let's take a breath and we'll go out again with our heart chant. Open my heart, open my heart, open my heart, open my heart, open my heart. Open my heart. Open my heart. Open my heart.
heart. Open my heart. Open my heart. Open my heart. Open my heart. Open. May our hearts be open and opening. May we look more and more with the eye of our heart. May we stake our center of selfhood more and more in the open space nameless presence and objectless love of the heart. Amen. So thank you all, lovely souls, for gathering. And we'll gather back at 10 uh, tomorrow morning. Same Zoom place, same Zoom time, same Zoom channel. Um, and I'll try to bring some attachments to share in the chat feature. And uh, I encourage you tonight to do some work with this prayer of the heart. Don't drop it. Um, if you go out for a walk or if you do your centering prayer, whatever your practice is, come back to your heart. Just keep familiarizing yourself, acquainting yourself with that, that center, that space. And notice what shifts when you eat food with mind in your heart or have a conversation with a friend with mind in your heart. And you can do a little reporting back on what your experience is when we gather tomorrow. All right, go in peace. See you soon. God willing.